Hello again, I'm Maurice Barrett. I'm excited because I'm starting a, a brand new series. And the title is Preparing for Christ's Return. I'm not talking about what the church called the rapture. That's when we, we go to meet Jesus in the air and you fit it to where your doctrinal bias is. But those that meet him in the air are going to come down with him. So the return of Jesus to this earth I'm talking about, the rapture is not the return of Jesus. We meet him in the air and then he comes with his saints down to earth. So this is about the return of Jesus. Well, I've been thinking of this series for, for a few years now and I, I feel it's the right time to, to share it. I've called this The Last of the Last Days because it's an introduction to the series. There'll be many studies. I suppose there'll be 20 or 30 studies. I've already written one book that I'm going to include, uh, The First Resurrection. But this little weekend conference, we're going to look at four studies. And this is the first one, the last of the last days. Well, there's many exhortations and instructions in the Bible to help us for the return of Jesus and many warnings. So we're going to look at them. So many times the apostles and Jesus talk about the last days. So we don't have to guess, do we? We don't have to wonder about the last days because Jesus talks extensively about them. There's whole chapters, Matthew 24 and 25 and Luke 20, uh, 21 uh, and many other scriptures. So we can look at them and, and find out what, what's going to happen in these last days. So one of the, the first thing that Jesus says is take heed, watch out, be careful. So that's a warning. If we're in the last of the last days, he said, many times Jesus and Paul said, don't be deceived. So let's look at some scriptures that talk about it. Because I want to show that we're in the last of the last days. Luke 21 verse 8. And Jesus said, take heed that you're not deceived. For many shall come in my name saying, I am Christ. And the... And the time draweth near, go ye not therefore after them. I need to comment on that. I don't think it's people in the last days who will say, I'm Jesus Christ, because that wouldn't fool anyone. What they're saying is, I, I am Christ, I'm representing, I'm God's man, I'm, I'm the prophet, you know, I'm Christ, I'm uh, I'm anointed. That That's what the Christ means, the anointed. So they're going to come as anointed men. Go not after them. And Luke 21, verse 34. Again, take heed to yourselves. So watch out, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with suffiting and drunkenness and cares of this world. Remember, the cares of this life choke Christians and they become unfruitful. That was the, th the third category, I think, of the sower. They, they, they're going, they're, they're being disciples, and then the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, choke them, and they become unfruitful. That, that's a third of, of people who start on discipleship. So that the days come upon you unawares. So those people who become unfruitful, the return of Jesus is going to catch them out. And 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 3. Here again, let no man deceive you. This is the third time we've talked about deception. That's one of the signs of the last day's great deception. Paul says, let no man deceive you by any means. For that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, son of damnation. I believe that's the one world dictator. Don't let any man deceive you. Jesus won't come again, it's because verse 1 says, by the coming of our Lord Jesus and our gathering together unto him, this day won't happen. So Jesus won't return until first the Son of Man, the uh, Son of Perdition revealed. Matthew 24, verse 11. And many false prophets shall arise and shall deceive many, not deceive a few. Many is the majority. It didn't say he will deceive some of you or deceive a few. Many false prophets shall arise and deceive many. 
I can see it happening in the church. Matthew 24, verse 24. For there shall arise false prophets, Christ, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. So if you're running around looking for miracles and signs and wonders, be careful, because the false prophets are going to show signs and wonders and they would deceive even the elect because if somebody brings fire down from heaven, we'll say, well, this is Elijah. He's come to prepare the way of the Lord. So you don't follow signs and wonders, do you? Signs and wonder follow us. Preach the gospel. These signs shall follow. So the signs and wonders should follow the preaching of the word. We don't follow the signs and the wonders. They follow us when we preach the truth. So it's dangerous to, to be looking for signs and wonders and prophecies and you'll be led astray in the last days. And Mark 13, verse 5. And Jesus answered them and began to say, Take heed, lest any man deceive you. So, so I can't give the context to all of these, but... Jesus talked about deception so much, so did Paul. Well, the first thing I want to establish in this series is that not all believers, not all those who are saved are the bride of Christ. Well, the majority of believers that I've come across, they think all those who are saved are in the first resurrection and will be the bride of Christ, will be in the rapture. But I'm going to paint a different picture and I'm going to use scripture to substantiate it. So as we go through, just keep an open mind. Then I want to show that rather than the last day's revival before Jesus comes, there's going to be the opposite, a great falling away, an apostasy, not a revival. I can't find anywhere in the Bible where there's going to be a worldwide revival. I know there'll be pockets of revival. I know those that know uh, their God will do exploits. But it doesn't say there'll be a worldwide revival where millions will be swept into the kingdom. That's, that's the faith preacher's imagination. I can't find it in the Bible. And then I'm going to look at the letters to the seven churches because these letters are a warning that Jesus is judge his church when he returns, repent or else. The five of the seven churches had to repent. Repent or else I'll come and do this. Repent or I'll do that. And it's to those who overcome, get the promise. So if you don't overcome, you don't get the promise. So I believe that the bride are those that overcome. So the exhortation in the seven letters to the churches is to get rid of the spots and blemishes and to overcome and receive the ward. For the punishments are quite severe, as I'll show. I'll take the candlestick away. That's Christ, that's the light. Christ will be outside the church, knocking to come in like he was in one of the churches. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. So Jesus is outside the church trying to get in. And after that, I'll concentrate on the dialogue of Jesus in the upper room with his disciples after the Passover, because I believe that's the contract between Christ and the church, the bride. That's from John 13 to 18. So that'll cover 20 or 30 studies, I'm sure. So let's look at the, the subject, the last of the last days. Well, the last day started with the apostles because Peter claimed it, Acts 2, verse 16. Peter stood up on the day of Pentecost when the men said, you're drunk. And he said, no, we're not drunk, it's only the third hour. This is that that was spoken by the prophet Joel. And he quotes Joel. So this is verbatim what Joel said. And it shall come to pass in the last days. So this is Joel in the Old Testament prophesying of the last days. So Peter said, this are the last days. This is what Joel prophesied. We now start in the last days, the last dispensation. In the last days, I will pour my spirit upon all flesh. 
and your sons and daughters shall prophesy, your young men shall see visions, your old men shall see dreams. That didn't happen in the Old Testament. There were only certain prophets who were visionaries who saw dreams. It wasn't on everyone, was it? But after Pentecost, anyone, any housewife can prophesy. <laughs> any housewife can lay hands on the sick and they'll recover. He's poured his spirit on all flesh. And on my servants and on my handmaidens, I will pour out in those days of my spirit and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapour of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and notable day of the Lord come. This is his return, the day of the Lord. Well, that's interesting, isn't it? And it shall come to pass that whoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Well, part of it was fulfilled on the day of Pentecost. But the rest of the passage hasn't been fulfilled. The last two verses, verse 19, let's go back to 19. So the Holy Ghost was poured out on all flesh. But then he says, and I'll show wonders in heaven above, signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapour of smoke. That's not happened. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood. Well, that didn't happen at Pentecost and it's not happened since before the great and notable day of the Lord. So Joel was prophesying his first coming and his second coming. And Peter was saying the first part's fun fulfilled and he was prophesying about the second coming of Jesus. So now I believe we're at the end of the last days, the last of the last days. These are the times of the Gentiles. Luke 21, verse 24. He's talking about the last days. They said, when's the sign of your coming and the end of the world? So Jesus is actually talking about the last days in context. And Jesus said, they shall fall by the edge of the sword and be led away captive unto all nations. Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles. I believe that was AD 70 until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. So Jerusalem was trodden down, A.D. 70, until the time of the Gentiles be fulfilled. It's not been built for 2,000 years, has it? Jerusalem's been desolate. The temple's not been there. There's never been no priest, no high priest to forgive the nation once a year on the Day of Atonement. So Jerusalem was trodden down until the times of the Gentiles, this dispensation is fulfilled. And I believe we're very close to it being fulfilled. You know, world history can be divided into three. Uh, it, there's lots of dispensations, I know. But it's interesting because we're now 6,000 years since Adam. We're ready for the thousand-year millennial reign of Christ. That's the six days. Adam to Abraham is about 2,000 years. People say it's 2,008 years because they can't work it out exactly. So we'll say 2,000 years. From Abraham to Jesus is about 2,000 years. And from Jesus till now is 2,000 years. Can you see the different dispensations? And now we're in the time of the Gentiles. So this is the last day of creation. We're fast approaching the last thousand years. When we talk about the day of the Lord, it's not a 24-hour day. It's, it's a thousand years. He's talking about the seven days of creation. God has worked on this earth for 6,000 years and is going to rest for a thousand years because God created the earth in six days and rested on the seventh day. So a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years as a day. Peter gives us the key. It's not by chance he says a thousand years as a day is as a day. He could have said 10,000 years is as a day, or 500 years, but that's a key. It's not just a throwaway line. Let me read it in 2 Peter 3, verse 5 to 8. And he's talking about the last days. 
And it, uh, it's an answer to the question. People say, when's the sign of his coming? And, you know, people have been saying Jesus has been coming for, 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 for years. The end of the first thousand years, uh, people said Jesus will come. And then the millennium, we've, uh, I've lived through this millennium, uh, the end of it, 2000. Uh, the end of 1999 and people said oh maybe Jesus will come but Peter said for this they are willingly ignorant they don't understand the timeline of God that by the word of God the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of the water and in the water that's when God separated the firmaments at creation he took the waters above and the waters below and the dry land appeared whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. That's Noah's Ark. But the heavens and the earth, which are now by the same word kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition, damnation of ungodly men. And then he gives the key, but beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing. You say you've waited a long time. Don't be ignorant because one day with the Lord is like a thousand years and a thousand years is like a day. So, of course, we've been waiting centuries and centuries and centuries, but we've got to wait till 6,000 years because it's the sixth day. Can you see how accurate? God's planned it all. It's not by chance. Fancy you being born on the eve of the millennium. Fancy that. That's amazing, isn't it? Such a time as this. So Peter said, don't be ignorant. It's all planned. It's not arbitrary. You can't force Jesus to come. Praying Jesus come quickly won't make him come. He'll come at the time appointed. Well, if we're in the last of the last days, and I believe we are, the priority of the believers is to prepare themselves to meet the bridegroom. If Jesus is coming again, what's he coming for? He's coming for three things. He's coming to plead with Israel to return to God so that God gets his wife restored. He's going to get his bridegroom and he's going to rule the nations with a rod of iron for a thousand years. So from our perspective, we're not Israel, so we're not going to be reconciled to God. We're already reconciled through Jesus because we're his bride. He's coming for us. That's, the, that's what every believer should wait for. Jesus is coming for his bride. So we've got to get ourselves ready. I believe it's time to get in the ark. Prepare for what's coming on the earth. I've said it in other studies, but it's interesting that when God said to Noah, the rain's coming, get in the ark, God brought all the animals and Noah got them all in the ark and they were all safe in the ark. The rain didn't come. God shut the door and seven days later the rain came. Now seven is, is fulfilment, isn't it, in the Bible? Seven means completion. So that's interesting. In other words, there was a time that was fixed. Don't forget, nobody could get saved in those seven days. They couldn't get in the ark. God shut the door. So if they said, oh, no, we believe you now, the door was shut and nobody in the ark could be drowned. If they said, oh, I don't believe in God, too late, they're in the ark, they're going to be saved. Can you see? God sealed them. In the last days, God seals 144,000, doesn't he? There's, there's some sealings. It's interesting that when you're sealed, you can't be opened. That's why you seal the letter. Nobody can open it. It, the postman can't look in because he'd break the seal. Only the recipient of the letter can open the, the seal. And so Noah was sealed in the ark. And I think the days are coming when evangelism will stop. It won't stop. People will carry on evangelism. But the bride will say it's time to get ready and get in the ark, separate from the world. Don't forget the world is going to be destroyed. So I think that's part of the purification. Imagine you out of the world for seven days. God can prepare you. The bride's made herself ready. There's a time to, to get ready where you're sealed in with God and you can't backslide. And I believe that's when we'll finally be purified. I don't know what you think of that, but that's 
That's what I think. The last days, the Bible says, there'll be pestilence, ter terrible destruction on earth preceding Jesus' return. So why aren't the church preparing for persecution? Uh, they're not prepared to close down the church buildings. They're, they're, they're building bigger buildings and they're planning to evangelise and get bigger. How many churches in Great Britain, that's my country, and America and Europe and, and Africa and India, where there's massive churches, where are they preparing for another long-term lockdown? They never thought the lockdown would last long when the, the government said you can't open the churches uh, because of the pandemic. You know, as soon as it's over, you can open them again. So they thought, well, it's all right. It'll only be a, a month or a, six weeks. People prophesied in uh, February that it would be a Passover. By Passover comes, they worked it all out, as people do. And they said, by Passover, it, you know, the pandemic will be gone and God will destroy it and will worship again. But it went on for a long, long time, didn't it? And how many churches have planned for another long, long lockdown? You know, the government have told us there'll be more pandemics. They've, they've, they've said it. There's going to be more pandemics. It's just a matter of time. So we're in the new normal now, we're back to normal, but we've called it the new normal because it's far from normal. And there'll be more restrictions than ever. More control, more fear-mongering. Don't forget the mark of the beast is coming and it'll be supported by fear. People close the churches because they were frightened. Frightened of the pandemic, frightened of the government, frightened of what people will think. I don't know. But people wouldn't go and worship because of fear. And if you don't worship the beast, you'll be killed. So that's a threat, isn't it? Let's read it, Revelation 13. This is the Antichrist. The beast is the one world dictator. They work together. The woman who rides the beast. And they had power... So this is the head of Babylon, the head of the counterfeit church. He had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. So it's you don't have to fear the mark. It's nothing to do with the mark. It's will you worship the image. If you don't, you'll be killed. So there's not the threat of the mark. The threat is to be killed. The mark of the beast is the freedom to those who bow. Just like the vaccine passport was. When you got your vaccine passport, oh, I can travel, I can go to Asta, I can go about. That was your freedom. And Christians don't realise it. And it causeth all both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in the right hand of the forehead. That's, that's after. If you won't worship, you're killed. So we don't have to worry about the, the, the mark of the beast. And that no man might by a cell say if he had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. These are the people who've bowed. The Christians who won't, it said they'll be killed. So it's, that's, that's the threat. Or God will miraculously save you like he did with the, the fiery furnace. They said we won't bow and they were thrown in the furnace. But it only freed them. So I believe some people will be freed who won't bow, but many will be killed, I'm sure. There's been many martyrs, haven't they? Many of the prophets were killed, but Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego were saved. Well, Nebuchadnezzar used fear, didn't he, with the fiery furnace to make everyone bow to the statue he'd erected. Fear is one of the tools of Satan. His first tool is seduction, always. Satan doesn't want to use force. He doesn't want to use fear because he wants to be like God. And, and Satan wants you to worship him of your own free will. So he'll seduce you. He didn't threaten Eve, did he? He seduced her. And Israel, he didn't threaten Israel. They were seduced to worship idols. Satan will always rather seduce you. But if you won't be seduced, then fear is his second 
string to his bow. Well, 9-11, with its supposed threat of future terrorism, was part of the plan to bring the net down to control the whole world, set up the man of sin. God showed my wife and I 13 years before the towers came down that this would start the plan. So I'm confident in saying this. I've not just guessed it. God told us. The supposed threat of terrorism. What major terrorist act have we had since 9-11? That was 20 uh, 2001. So it's 21 years, 22 years ago. There's been no major terrorist attack, has there? There's been a few terrorist attacks, but nothing like 9 11. But it put the world in fear. Do you know when you go to the airport, they've still got the restrictions that they put on at 9 11. You still have to go through all the cameras and the body scans and everything. And yet, the threat of terrorism isn't there. Very few people die of terrorism. I think the number is very small. I had the statistics for America, those that had been killed in terrorism over the last few years. Those who died of lung cancer and other diseases and road accidents, more people get killed on the roads than through terrorism. So, you know, it, it's, uh, but it's, it's a fear. And the pandemic was another major step. I believe God showed me that that was another major step. And we're not going backwards, we're going further. The future's not good for planet Earth. I can't paint a good picture for the Earth. Jesus is coming. The false prophets are talking about revival and a mighty move of God. But true prophets are warned of an impending doom. And the return of Jesus to judge the nations and open the seals for judgment to begin. The seals are the judgment, aren't they? I don't think they've started yet. But Jesus is the only one who can open the seals for judgment to begin. Well, it's not a long study. God's placed a burden on my heart to warn people and help them prepare. That, that's, that's my main focus. Not to build a church, not to get followers, to, to warn people about the last days and prepare them. That's my job as a teacher. Prepare them for the return of Jesus. And I have a burden. Uh, I feel I've got to work hard. Jesus said, work well, it's day. The night's coming when no man can work. Because we've got to account for the things that we've done in our body. Let me read 2 Corinthians 5.10. This is what Paul says, and this is a warning to Christians. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. This is when he returns, that everyone may receive the things done in his body. Well, you're saved. He's talking to Christians who are saved. Received the things done in your body. That's how you've lived as a Christian, according to that he hath done, whether it's good or bad. And we'll see in future studies that if it's good, you'll receive a reward. If it's bad, you'll receive punishment. There's rewards and punishments at the judgment seat of Christ because it's nothing to do with salvation. After Babylon falls, God told John through Jesus and the angel that the bride's made herself ready. And after that, Jesus will come with the armies of heaven down to earth. He's coming to, as a... Uh, as a general, as a, a lion, not as a lamb, how he came the first time. He came as a lamb to be slain, didn't he? He's coming as a lion to take over. And he's coming with the armies of heaven. It's going to be a, a military coup. He's going to take over the world. There's a battle, the Battle of Armageddon, where the armies of the, the Antichrist and the man of sin will try and fight Jesus and stop him coming to earth. But he'll smite them with the word of his mouth that there'll hardly be a battle. But, but it'll be a battle. It's the, the feast of the Lord. He calls all the fowls. Come all the fowls, all the carrion, because the slain are going to be millions on the earth. Let's read it, Revelation 19. 
After these things I heard a great voice of much people in heaven saying, Hallelujah! Salvation and glory and honour and power unto the Lord our God. For true and righteous are his judgments, for he has judged the great whore. This is the counterfeit church that Jesus will judge just before he comes, which did corrupt the earth with the fornication. This is spiritual fornication, other gods, and hath avenged the blood of his servants at her hand. Every single person who's been killed in this earth and the blood has gone into the ground is because of the system of Babylon. All the martyrs, all the blood of all the saints, all those that are slain on the earth, it says. And again they said, hallelujah, and the smoke rose up forever and ever. That's it, finished. Babylon falls. And because Babylon is tied to all the commerce and the, the politics, they all collapse with her. You can read it. And the four and twenty elders and the four bees fell down and worshipped God that sat on the throne, saying, Amen, hallelujah. And a voice came out of the throne saying, Praise our God, all ye servants, and ye that fear him, both small and great. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, as the voice of many waters, and the voice of mighty thundering, saying, Hallelujah, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Let us re be glad and rejoice, and give honour to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come. It's prophesied Jesus is coming again for his bride. The marriage of the Lamb is come and his wife has made herself ready. You'll never get ready when you're in the world. You'll have to get in the ark. You can't do it. I've been trying it ever since I was six years old to live a holy life. You, you can't do it. People think that I do, but I know I'm in the world and I've never escaped it fully. Uh, however far you've gone, and I've met some holy men in my time, not many, but they confessed that they're not free from the world's influence. You need to get in the ark and get sealed in the last days. The marriage of the Lamb is coming, his wife has made herself ready. You know, just before the bride gets, uh, when the groom comes for the bride, what does she do a few days before? She doesn't go out on the town and get drunk. She, she wants to be fit. She detoxes herself weeks before. She thinks, I don't want to spotty and I don't want to be. So she slims down and she makes sure she's nice. She, she, she prepares herself. And, and those who are looking after, look after her and, and comb her hair. Have you never seen a bride getting ready? It's a right palaver, isn't it? She's there, she has a, a makeover and she has a special hair done. And she, I mean, I've seen some women that I would, I'm not saying ugly, but certainly not pretty. But I'll tell you what, on the wedding day, I've never seen an ugly bride because they do the best, don't they, to make them over and their hair and lovely clothes and lovely perfume. They're exquisite. It takes a lot of preparation to get a bride ready. Do you think you could just turn up and Jesus will say, Oh, my bride, when you're in your working clothes and your hair's matted and you've had a wash for a week and you're spotty and got B.O.? I mean, it's not reasonable, isn't it? We've got to get ready. And then Revelation 19, verse 11. So this is just a few years later. Uh, a few years, a few verses later. So the bride's made herself ready, and then when she's ready, he comes. And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat on him was faith, called faithful and true, and in righteousness he shall judge and make war. He's coming to make war. His arms were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. That's his eyes of flames of fire. That's Revelation chapter 1, when John sees him. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. That's interesting, isn't it? Who is this that comes from Bosra with his garments dyed in blood? That's a, I'm quoting a prophecy in the Old Testament. Who is this that comes from Bosra? That's Edom. It's because he's been to Edom and slaughtered Edom and he's, he's, he's trod the winepress and his, his garments are splattered with blood. He's come with a vesture dipped in blood and his name is called the Word of God, so we know it's Christ. 
and the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. Now, the, the, the fine linen, white and clean, the clothes, that's the righteousness of the saints because it tells you in another verse, a few, few verses before. That's, I believe that's the righteous body. They're in linen, white and clean. I don't think those are garments. I think that's the resurrection body. They're clothed with a new body, the righteousness of Christ. We have the, I have the righteousness of Christ now, but I haven't got a righteous body. But when I'm raptured, when Jesus comes, I'll get I'll be clothed with the righteous body. And out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, and with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath of Almighty God. There's going to be a slaughter. I feel it my bounden duty to prepare believers for the future. You know, Paul tells the Christians in Rome that your redemption is nearer than when you believed. And he was saying that almost 2,000 years ago. Let me read it, your Romans 13. Now this is Paul because he expected Jesus to come any time. He didn't have the revelation that we have because he was in the beginning of the last days. And that knowing the time that now it is high time to awake out of sleep, for now is our salvation, salvation nearer than when we believed. I first believed I accepted Jesus when I was six years old, so that's over 70 years ago. Well, it's 70 years nearer since I first believed. It's nearer. Don't, don't, don't think it, it, it's, it's not very close. It's nearer than when we believed. The night is far spent. The day is at hand, that's the day of the Lord. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and put on the armour of light. We need the armour on in the last days, don't we? Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chamberlains and wantonness, not in strife and envying, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Clothe yourself with Christ. Don't make provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. Cut those things that cause you to lust. Cut away those things that cause you to be covetous. Cut away those things that cause you to exaggerate and lie and be deceitful. What a challenge. I've come to the end of the study. I pray you'll be challenged and exhorted and excited to think that you could be included in the re uh, generation destined for the first resurrection and changed into the bride and returning in the clouds with Jesus to judge the nations, set up the millennial kingdom with Jesus, coerce with Christ. You know, this series should excite you. I know I've got to talk about doom and gloom because these are the last days and there's the church falling into apostasy and fearful things are coming in the world. But we look up, our redemption draws near. So let me encourage you, get excited about Jesus coming because the excitement and the fear of him coming will help you to get rid of the spots and wrinkles. Well, the time's gone. The next study is many called and few chosen. Tune in to see it. God bless you. Have a wonderful week.